Very good morning to you all. We're up to Acts chapter 26. Uh, 25, beg your pardon. It's 25 and 26 that we're looking at today. So we'll go back to the beginning of 20. Uh, we'll go back to the end of 24 uh, to get the context. Here we are. Um, after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix. And Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Now, if you take a look at history, you'll find that Felix was, was made governor by Emperor Claudius, Caesar of the time. Felix had been freed by Claudius. He was a slave before that, he wasn't a freed man. Um, so Felix <clears throat> was one of the favorites of Claudius, and he was made procurator uh, of um, uh, Judea. So uh, there he was, um, of, uh, uh, and he was in Caesarea, of course. Tertullus, a Roman, um, not Tertullus, Tertullian, uh, the Roman historian, calls Felix a, um, a violent and uh, licentious man. He uh, he had no issues in seducing Drusilla the uh, the sister of um, of Herod uh, to be his wife. He had three. He, he was a very, as far as his morals were concerned, very loose. Um, so that he left Paul bound is no surprise. He's no different from from. Uh, many of the politicians, unfortunately, <clears throat> Polit politics used to be an honourable profession. It's become much less so in recent days. Um, right throughout the Western world, it's been infected on purpose by people with satanic agenda rather than a godly agenda. Servants of Satan, really. Um, and uh, they will do whatever it takes to remain in power. Uh, and if they can do someone a favor and be in the good books, whether it's just or not, that unfortunately is uh, many of our politicians today are of that ilk. Felix was no different. So this has been around for years and years. We had a, a, a period of grace where, as I say, politics was an honourable profession and men would and women would keep their word. That is finished now. Anyway, so uh, during this time, Felix was there with his wife, Drusilla. And even being this wicked man that he was, he gladly heard Paul, but he wouldn't release him. No, uh, politics um, stood in the way of justice. Politics should never stand in the way of justice, guys. That should never, ever be the case. But politics did. It stood in the way of justice. Let's go over, though. Um, so the next one, Felix has now been succeeded by Festus, and Festus is far more honourable than Felix, Portius Festus. Now, when Festus had come to the province, after three days, you see how quickly he's starting to deal with things. After three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. The high priest, beg your pardon, he doesn't deal with it right away, but he deals with it uh, as soon as these um, 
the council get together against Paul. The high priests and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul, and they petitioned him, asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem. While, here it is again, while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore he said, let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there's any fault in him. And when he had remained among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting in the judgment seat, he commanded Paul to be brought. And when he had come, uh, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which indeed they could not prove. Lying doesn't seem to be an issue with these people. Oh, I'm going to bring you in to the, this one here. Okay, so there we are. They couldn't prove those accusations that they made. While he, that's Paul, answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar. Have I offended in anything at all? <clears throat> but Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Now, Paul knows what the Jews are like. They've got no interest in true justice. They just want to do away with Paul. So, Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Right now, that was true. He was in front of Festus. Where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong. As you very well know. For if I am an offender, or have committed anything deserving of death... I do not object to dying, but if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. As a Roman citizen, Paul could do that. He had rights these others had no, no idea of. As Christians, we have rights before God that those who don't belong to him, those who are of the household uh, of the wicked one, <clears throat> we have rights. Uh, I was just having a, a Bible study the other night with a number of people. Um, and in First Peter, uh, Second Peter, it, it talks about great and precious promises whereby we can become uh, partakers of the divine nature. In other words, we can have the attributes of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We can have these attributes that are the very nature of God. Now, those who don't know Christ might look like they have some of these attributes as well. That's true. But um, it's always from a natural uh, standpoint. They haven't been cleansed by the blood of Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin, the Bible says, as we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Have you gone from the, the domain of darkness into the, the kingdom of God's dear Son, the kingdom of light? Then you've got amazing, great and precious promises. So we have rights. We, we have a standing before God uh, that those who are not citizens of heaven, don't have. And the thing is, they're hoping that this life is all there is. What a horrible hope that this life is all there is. What a miserable way to live, to think you've gone through this whole life, learning things, becoming creative in various ways, um, having family, 
and you're hoping that this life is all there is because you don't want to move from darkness to light. You don't want to come under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is a kingdom of light after all and he's king. Anyway, Paul, he also had rights, rights that other people in the Roman Empire, many, or the, the bulk, didn't have because he was a Roman citizen by birth. Paul of Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, as he was known back in those days. I appeal to Caesar. No one can deliver me. Now, um, Festus could have delivered him to them if he wasn't a Roman citizen. So Paul does what all he can do. There he goes. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. He, he confers with the council. Yeah. Because the council has got nothing to say against him uh, concerning anything to do with breaking Roman law. Anyway, after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice, that's his wife, came to Caesarea to greet Festus. Now, just to give you a bit of context, that's King Herod Agrippa the second. He's the son of the King Herod that was eaten of worms. Uh, after he took the applause of, of, of someone, they were all saying a god, not a man. Anyway, um, and uh, this King Agrippa is actually the brother of Felix's wife, Drusilla. Uh, so Felix has come up in the world from being a slave to being procurator. Uh, but he's left that now, and it's now Festus in charge. Festus lasts about two years before he dies while still in office. But after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And when they'd been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face. And that is something that has come down to our times as well. It's only in extraordinary circumstances where the accused doesn't see the accuser face to face. And that's generally when the accusers are minors. In other words, they're children or under the age of 16. Okay, and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they'd come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him about their own religion. I beg your pardon, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, as I imagined that they would but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Oh well, yes, and rightly so. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appeared, appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, Augustus Caesar now, you see, not Claudius anymore. I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and ceremony uh, and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man, about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. 
But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, that he himself had appealed to, to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my lord concerning him. Now, you, you, you see, um, Festus himself freely says Caesar is lord. And that was the, as long as everybody was willing to say that, uh, they could have whatever religion they liked. Christians, on the other hand, said Jesus is Lord, and that tended to get them into trouble uh, because uh, they they often weren't happy about calling Caesar Lord. Anyway, write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I've brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send the prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So we come to Acts chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I'm accused by the Jews especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, <coughs> that according to the strictest sect, of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. That's, that was the strictest set. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. And he's talking about the resurrection, guys, if you haven't got, got that yet, the promise of the coming resurrection of whom Jesus is the first fruits. He's the very first one to be resurrected um, uh, into his glorified body. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Well, indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints, he's talking about the, the people of the way, he's talking about Christians, I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, Caiaphas and Annas, or as Luke calls him, Ananias. I received authority from the chief priests, and when they, were, when they the Christians, were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus, and that's a foreign city because it's in Syria, it's in neither uh, the Judean region nor the Galilean region or Samaria further north. As I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. The goads are the sharpened sticks that they use uh, to, to keep the oxen going, plowing the ground or um, that kind of thing. So I said, who are you, Lord? So it's, he's kicking against the goads would be to kick against the sharpened points. Uh, a waste of time, really. So I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. for I have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you 
from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And that was the troublesome thing, you see. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. And the Jews didn't like that because they were supposed to be the only ones who were God's chosen people. And now God is saying, I've got a, I've got a, uh, a new covenant. And under this covenant, anybody can be saved. I'll deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's Jesus speaking to Paul, by faith in Jesus. So anybody may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance, not just the Jews now, but the Gentiles. And many of the zealous Jews, zealous for Judaism, hated that idea. And so even though they might have mentally been con um, been convinced uh, by Paul bringing the Old Testament scriptures to life for them, showing that Jesus was the Messiah, there's a saying that goes like this, convince a man against his will, he's of the same opinion still. So you can convince someone by argument, but if you've got a, a, a Jew who who hates the idea that salvation can come to the Gentiles, he will argue with himself against what has just been uh, shown to be true. Anyway, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent turn to God, and do works fitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ is the Messiah, Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew, that the Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. So this is Paul's, uh, Festus's take on the whole thing. People don't just rise from the dead. He's got a very much a view, like a lot of those who in, in, our, in our Western countries have been taught in schools. I'm a, I'm a math teacher, by the way, um, and I've taught science as well, uh, but that the material world is all we have. Angels don't exist. God doesn't exist. These things, um, we, the only thing that exists is what we see and feel and touch. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, nothing else exists. But we have no evidence for that whatsoever. But it's very easy to come to that conclusion if that's what you've been raised with. Uh, Festus did believe in gods, of course, but he didn't believe in men raising, being raised from the dead. And he certainly didn't believe in any Jewish myths and, and, and fables, which is what he would have called the Old Testament uh, and yet, the Apostle Paul can unpack all of those promises about the coming Messiah from the Old Testament to prove that Jesus was the Christ. So much learning is driving you mad. Festus comes to that con conclusion. Um, and of course, Festus, with a name like Portius, Festus is unlikely to have had a lot of learning as far as uh, the scriptures were concerned. Now, but he, that's Paul, said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, that's Agrippa, before whom I also speak freely, 
knows these things. For I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. King Agrippa, of course, was part Jewish, uh, being the, uh, um, the brother of Priscilla, who was a, a Jewess. Um, uh, but Herod, Herod came from a different line, but he, but he married into um, and so claimed a right to be able to uh, um, have a say in Jewish matters, in Jewish religious matters, what's more. Do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. <laughs> So the name Christian has traveled all the way from Syrian Antioch, where they were first named Christians, all the way to Agrippa himself, Herod Agrippa II. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. That's awesome. I love it. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, might but become both almost and altogether such as I am, uh, except for these chains. No, he didn't want them to be to be bound as he was. When he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they'd gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death, chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. <laughs> yeah, but if, if he'd agreed to go to Jerusalem, uh, they would have laid in wait for him and he would be dead. Uh, then he'd be really free, that's true, he'd be in heaven. Uh, he'd be with the Father and with those who have gone before. That's not the final state, by the way. The final state is where the new Jerusalem comes to earth. A new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. You and I look forward to that. We should. In the meantime, we are in these, these tents, as the Apostle Paul calls our bodies, which are not going to be our final abode. No. This mortal, this body that has a tendency to sin, is going to put on immortality. You and I need to, and, and you can't conjure this up, guys. Our, our affection needs to be on things above, not on things of this earth. And too often mine is not. But I, I do count it an absolute privilege uh, to be able to share this with you guys. I do love the Word of God. Um, and and the way I've, um, I've learned this, what I know, pardon me, is simply making it my practice to read through the Bible. And it's 66 books. Uh, but just in one volume, guys, Old Testament, New Testament, I've made it my practice to read through the Bible once every year. Oh, we read other parts, of course, um, at different times at church uh, and in our Bible studies, of course, there's more. But if you read three chapters a day, um, you'll read 90, 93 chapters in 31 days a month. You basically need to read 100 chapters a month which is a little bit more than three chapters a day. But regardless, three chapters a day, you'll, you'll basically get through the, the, the whole Bible in a year. Much of it is easy read. It's just history, like we're reading here in the book of Acts. Very easy. And uh, many, many um, Bibles have notes as well. What can I say? My daughter 
my oldest daughter Elise has written a uh, a, a flyer of, on the value of life and the and the value of your life and the value of the unborn and, and old people you know uh, and the hope we have before him in Christ and and what she writes is just scripture after scripture your life is precious your soul is precious to God uh, the Bible says uh, Jesus himself says what will it profit a man or, or a woman obviously if they gain the whole world if they own the whole world now there are elites whose desire is to rule the whole world their desire is that every nation it comes under their sway and does the things they say. And they've already achieved a lot of that. Let me put that to you right now. Um, their influence on the free nations of the West, the so-called free nations of the West, is such that we are less free now than we were, say, uh, 30 to 50 years ago. Their influence is, they've gained that much influence. But the time's going to come when those guys who don't serve God, they serve Satan. You're either in one camp or the other guys. If you're serving yourself, you're doing what Satan wants you to do. Uh, it's called selfishness and it'll end in separation from God. Uh, unless you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, unless your sins have been forgiven, you are by default, simply because we're sinners, uh, we're in Satan's camp. The Bible says you were all, it's everybody, apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, all those who have lived on this planet, uh, you, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Yeah, that's the default position. But you, he has made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sins. And what a privilege to be made alive. It's called being born again, or being born into God's family. By rights, you're his through creation. You're made in the image of God. Imago Dei, image of God. Uh, what does that mean? It means you've got a conscience, you've got free will, you've got you've got something, the spark, that the rest of creation doesn't have. The animal kingdom doesn't have that. You can have discussions with people about abstract things. That, that's not something that the animal world anywhere has. Whereas we, we have that. We're created in the image of God, but through sin... Sin that has separated us from God. Sin has separated. Now, God is a just God. He, he said right at the beginning to Adam and Eve, disobey me in this thing, that's the eating of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, disobey me and you will surely die. He wasn't talking about physical death because they lived many years after they ate the fruit. God was talking about their spiritual life. They became dead straight away in their trespasses and in their sins. God had to rescue them a second time. Now that happened when Jesus died on the cross, 4,000 years after Adam and Eve of the fruit. Jesus gave his life freely because, yes, as was said to Adam and Eve, the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. And in the New Testament, Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. God, the righteous judge, for his, his, his sentence against sin remained the same. 
And that's, that sentence was carried out when Jesus died. God demonstrates his love toward us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he paid the wages that we so richly deserved. We deserved the death. Jesus took it upon himself. And now it's the gift of God. By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift, not of works. Otherwise we could boast about it. For you are God's workmanship. Amen to that. Every human is actually God's workmanship. You can read that in Psalm 139. Fearfully and wonderfully made. For you are God's workmanship, but you're created in Christ Jesus. Now that's being born again. You've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. For good works, which God prepared for you in advance. God has good works for you to do. Your good works won't save you. No, Christ saves you. It's a free gift. But he's got some good works for you to do. Have you found that yet? Have you found the good works that God has for you? One of the good works God has for me is to take my knowledge of Scripture. Uh, and, and I've read through the Bible. What have I read through the Bible? I used to, in my teens and, and 20s, I used to read through the Bible twice a year. Uh, but since I've been married and I have children, it's now become uh, once a year. Uh, and to be honest, the twice a year, uh, that was a great foundation. But now I spend a bit more time mulling over the different things I'm reading. Uh, but either way, you know, uh, I would say reading reading through the scriptures three or four times, and you're starting to get a bit of a handle of how how 66 books of the Bible hang together so beautifully. You know, without uh, the uh, the contradictions you would expect from 66 humans giving their own wisdom. No, this is this is God, God's handiwork, putting this together. The Bible tells us God, uh, who in times past, in many ways, spoke to us through the prophets, as in these last times spoken to us through His Son. Jesus. It also says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. It also says that holy men of God wrote as they were carried along, as they were moved, carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now they would say the Holy Spirit would imprint on their, their hearts the message he wanted to give, but they would put that message in their own words. So every book has its own characteristic um, uh, of the person who's writing. So we can recognize Paul's writing, for example, because he has a particular style. But the message, the message is always what God is imprinting on their heart. And it's the same, you know, I'm not going to write a book of the Bible. But God will often give to me, as I'm speaking to, to others who are, who are listening, God will give me this verse and that verse and help me to just unpack that so that people can hear and understand. It's just, it's God's Spirit speaking to us, and we're simply passing that on. Now, that's not to say that every word I say here uh, of... of um, is something that the Holy Spirit has um, imprinted on me, but much of it is, you know. God speaks to me in these things, speaks to my heart, I tell you. You know, I'm, I'm preaching to myself half the time here, as well as uh, you good folk who are listening. We're only good because of, <laughs> of what Christ has done for us, eh? Um, cleansed by the blood of, our, of the Lamb. We are such blessed, blessed people. So, you know, we might be coming to the end of this particular age, but we've got a promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, I'm with you always, 
even to the end of the age. The very last verse in the book of Matthew. He's talking to Christians. And he'll be with us right to the end of the age when Jesus returns. We are privileged indeed. But he also says, guys, um, there's coming a tribulation. Time of trouble as has not yet even been seen in the world and, and won't be seen again. There's going to be a time of tribulation. The Antichrist will arise, deceiving many. He'll seem to be a man of peace, and he'll, he'll seem to be able to put all things, um, make, make things right again, you know, from a, a place where, where the nations are squabbling and against each other. It, it'll look like he's bringing peace to this world. Um, but he'll be a servant of Satan, unfortunately. He'll be the anti-Christ. He'll create a religion, which is a hodgepodge of uh, a whole lot of the main religions. Uh, and he'll, he'll, he'll have a false prophet who goes before him. Uh, and he'll be able to do various miracles, even making fire come from heaven down to earth. Uh, all the workings of Satan. And, uh, you know, the people were deceived, even, even if it were possible, the Bible says, the elect, those who belong to, to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, if it were possible, even the elect might be deceived. That's why, as my, my daughter wrote that, uh, that, that, um, that gospel pamphlet, and her, her comment was, guys, simply read the Bible. And the, peop the reason people might be deceived is because they don't know the scriptures. Get to know the scriptures. And that you're with me today is wonderful because you are getting some scriptures. Praise God. And that's so important. Get to know the scriptures. And I'll unpack as much as I can for you. But also, guys, read it for yourself or have the audible scriptures and listen to the scriptures during the day while you're working. Very easy. You can hear, you, you can hear the scriptures read. Um, it's funny. I was at a, uh, um, at a uh, rest home called the Gardens. And I was taking Bible studies there for the older folk. And one of the one of the ladies there is a dear old um, Scottish lady. And when she read the word, you could see this word was imprinted on her heart. So if I, if I wanted to listen to the to, to the to the um, word of God being read. I would have loved to have dear Flora read to me because here's someone who knows, who knows the God of the Bible. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. She was starting to, to lose her, her short-term memory a bit, you know. But a love of God remained there, clear as clear, clear can be. Guys, get to know the Bible. Get to love the Scriptures. There's so much truth. And the promises of God that are here, that are given, that you might become part, partakers, the Bible says, of the divine nature. That, in other words, you might become godlike, more like Jesus. And you can read uh, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, about the fruit of the Spirit. If you're like that, then you are like Jesus. Anyway, I've got to, uh, got to there. So as my, my daughter says, know the word. Read through the Bible and God will speak to you. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. It's, uh, as always, it's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you. Uh, and if you can, share this with others too. Come in, join um, the, uh, at my Discord, which you can scroll down uh, and speak to others there. Um, I, I just count it such a privilege, guys, to, to be with you. Thank you for joining me this morning, and God bless.